they wanted to re-sign me again for another season. And I said, okay, but I need to get more money. At the same time, that was the summer that Channel 4 had won the broadcasting rights to the Paralympic Games. I met up with a friend of mine. He's mentioned to me they've just finished their search for new presenting talent. He said, oh, the closing date is gone. If you can get a show reel in like yesterday, he'll consider it, he'll view it. Did a show reel, sent it in, and they were like, yeah, cool. We're going to put you as part of the cohort of presenters. But at the same time, my president of my club come back to me and said, okay, here's a new offer. So they give me what I wanted, but it was a gamble. Although Channel 4 said to me, we'll put you on the program to be a presenter. There's no guarantee that you will be a presenter at the games. <laughs> If we take a step back and go right back to the start, how was it that you fell in love with sports? I fell in love with sports because I guess two main reasons. One, I love and uh, loved and still love the competitive nature of sport. From young, just watching, so football was the first sport that I really started watching. I'm talking like uh, five, six, seven, eight. I just love the 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 competitive of trying to win a game of football, a game of sport. I love that, I'm very competitive myself. So that that appealed to me. But I also secondary, se second to that, I also loved um, how sp sport could be very different within the same sports. What I mean by that is, take again football for example, I love the different ways to win a game. I love the different ways to play football. I love that you've got Saka is a very different player to Rashford, but they're both phenomenal football players. And I love the different ways in which people would dribble or strike the ball or s save the goal. I, I, I've, I loved the differences of trying to achieve excellence within the same sport. We're not all trying to win the same way. Um, and from a very early age, that was something that I loved as well. I lo and it, people kind of, that are football fans talk about Burnley and Stoke being in the Premier League. Oh, get them teams out of the Premier League. I'm like, nah, bring them in. The more different ways to win a game. It's not my preferred way of playing football, granted. But I, pre I appreciate the different types of ways of trying to win a sport. And Djokovic is very different to Nadal. But they're both winners. And I like that. I, I don't want all my tennis players to play like Federer. I want them to be different. And I think that was what really appealed to me. The differences of how you could win a game. I definitely, definitely appealed to me. And especially it's quite different from a, like a team sport versus individual sports like, af like, like athletics, for example. Totally. Yeah. Which, which is why I, I, mean, I love football, I love basketball, but I, tennis is my fav one of my favourite sport. Yeah, I love individual sports because, as you say, first of all, it's all on you, but everybody's, everyone is different in, in an individual sport. In, in very kind of subtle ways, everyone is different. And that, that was something that I really, really... Um, gave me a lot of enjoyment, just seeing how, look at athletics, Michael Johnson's running style was very different to Carl Lewis, which is very different to Usain Bolt, but they're all winners and they're all doing the same sport, but they have different ways of achieving excellence and, 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 and becoming champions. Um, and that's demonstrated even more so in individual sports, but that's also why, bring back to football, I, I'm a really big fan of Pep Guardiola, because it's one thing if you can get, if a coach can get one athlete to do a particular, uh, an outcome in a particular style, can you get 22 players to buy into a style? That's, that's, that's a skill. And that's when people talk about Pep Guardiola couldn't manage at a lower level. I'm like, well, he probably couldn't, but what he can do is give him a, an elite group of players, get them all buying into one philosophy. And when he leaves them, the next coach can have a good job on his hands to try and get them to, to unpep them, if you like, and get them doing a different style as well. As, as well. So. I'm, I was always fascinated by the different ways in which sport could be. Yeah, it's quite it's quite interesting one, especially with the example with Pep Guardiola, Alex Ferguson, and the rest of it. Like, obviously, Guardiola is still there now, but I can imagine how hard it's going to be once he leaves, depending on the type of manager that comes in. What happened at you know? Leeds? Look at yeah. Leeds United under under Bielsa, who's left there now. People are talking about, oh, when he leaves, the next guy's going to have a hard job because that team is so ingrained in how he what he's drilled them for five years in a very specific way of playing football the next guy that comes along has got to as, as i mentioned unbielsa that team because that guy can't do what bielsa did but the team have got it in their head this is how we play football so the next guy's got to get that out of them first of all before he then imparts his own way of winning games so I, I always loved that, and I think that, that that translates across any industry. I love the different ways to achieve champion status. Yeah. I mean, you can tell that you're very passionate about football. I love my football, and man. And so, like, um, was that the first sport that you just played generally? Yeah. yeah. It's the biggest sport in the world, and, it's, you know, it's a, this is, a, this is a, a country that sports number one is the number one uh, sport in this country. 
and in the playground, you know, the school that I went to, we didn't have, you know, we didn't do lacrosse and we didn't have swimming pools in our schools and it was either football or rounders. That was pretty much it, you know what I mean? Um, so football was what we played at school and I, I, wasn't, I wasn't great at football. I wasn't the worst, but I wasn't, I wasn't brilliant at football, but I enjoyed it. I, I was all right. I was, I was like the, the Vieira of, 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 our, of our playground. I was, I was tall and lanky and I, I could get about, but I wasn't, I wasn't really a goal scorer. Um, sort of thing. So yeah, football from a very young age was something that I really, I really loved. So how did you get from football mm -hmm. to become a professional basketball player? Well, it's funny because f football and basketball, football I love more, but wasn't very good at. Basketball, I love a little bit less, but was very good at. So I started playing basketball at um, a secondary school. Uh, a PE teacher, Mr. Knight, um, was rounding up some 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 people to take part in the, in, in the in the team, and he made me captain, um, which which I I really I really enjoyed that role of being captain, and um, I was really good. I was really good. I would get, again, I wasn't the best one in the team. There were there were players in my team that were better than me, but I was good enough to be to be in the team. And you know, as you'll know, the, you don't have to necessarily be the best player to be a good captain. Um, there were three or four players that were better than me, but I was the best leader, I think, in that team, did a good job doing that. So that was when I started playing uh, running basketball. And I say running basketball because year nine, I started playing wheelchair basketball. So for those that don't know, I've got a prosthetic leg. I've got one leg. I was born with a deformed foot and I had it amputated at 18 months years old. So let me slow, let's slow down. Oh, I've gone too early. Gone so too <laughs> you were playing all these sports. <laughs> with one leg. <laughs> with one leg. <laughs> you were Patrick Vieira on one leg. <laughs> one leg. So in some ways I was better than Vieira when you think about it really. I was doing, I was doing what he was doing yeah. with half the tools. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, so I was, I was playing. My, my disability never really stopped me from doing anything I wanted to do. One, the one sport I can't do is swim, but I never use my disability as the reason because I've got friends that have no legs that are some of the fastest swimmers in the world. And someone said to me years ago, the heaviest part of your body are your legs. So losing your legs actually for swimming is an advantage. <laughs> it's actually an advantage, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Um, but that was never the reason why. I'm just, I just was scared of the water, it's a different thing. Um, so it never stopped me from doing sports. I, you know, I, I did rounders at school, I, you know, I did athletics. Again, I wasn't particularly fast, but I did all the sports. I, nothing, my leg didn't stop me from doing anything. Um, I was always very active and um, yeah, I, 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 love being, I love being active and love doing sports. So even when I was playing running basketball, uh, at school with my leg. It wasn't a big deal. Everyone at my school knew about my leg. So, all right, seeing it might have been, ah, but no one really made a big deal of it because everyone knew sort of uh, about it. But what I was told when I was coming to my latter years at school was, you know, you can't go pro. You can never go pro because of your leg. So I was like, oh, okay, cool, yeah, I didn't think about that. So it was a real consideration at the time, like you were wanting um, to take sports to, seriously? To, to be honest, I probably wasn't, if I'm being honest, I wasn't probably good enough to ever go pro anyway. Um, but I guess if I didn't have my disability, it could have at least been a consideration. Like, okay, maybe I'm not good enough now, but if I train the next couple of years, I can maybe get to play for a team in, in, in the UK. I don't know. Um, but that's when I decided. So this is all intertwined with how I got into wheelchair basketball. So I got into wheelchair basketball initially because when I was playing football for a team called Melwood in South London, after four years there, the coach told my mum, so yeah, we can't re-sign Jordan next, next year. Mum was like, why not? So because of his leg, for insurance reasons, we can't, we can't, we can't re-sign him, <laughs> it's dangerous. Not only for the players, but for him as well, which is, which is true, to be fair, but I was gutted. This is my mum, you know, I wanna play a sport, get me into a sport. Came back to me about a month later and said, oh, there's this, there's this um, thing in, um, in Haggerston, in Hackney, around the corner from me actually. Um, yeah, it's just down the road. Um, where they play wheelchair basketball, come along and check it out. So I was a bit like, wheelchair basketball, really? Really? Because you never used a wheelchair. I'd never, I never used a wheelchair. I'd never, you know, I've never used a wheelchair. I've never seen wheelchair basketball. Something that was not on my radar at all. But I was like, "Chuck, let me go along and, and, and see what's going on." Went along. Hated it. Hated it. Sat in a chair. It was. What's this? What's this? Hated it. They were running rings. Oh you, wasn't man, it? <laughs> it, was, it was embarrassing. It was embarrassing. <laughs> went back the following week. Hated it. Following week, hated it. But each week I went, I hated it a little bit less and less and less. And then I got good really quickly, and that always helps. Even if you don't love something, if you know you're better than everybody else in the room, that makes you think, oh, all right, I'm, gonna, I'm not loving this, but I'm better than all you lot, so let me just keep, keep doing this thing. And then before I knew it, I was playing for Great Britain Juniors team. Um, did that for like eight years. But yeah, so then that, that kind of overlaps into, I, was, I finished school, 
So I was playing wheelchair basketball through college, um, not playing football anymore, not playing running, running basketball anymore. So I was at that point just kind of paralleling my journalism career with playing semi-pro wheelchair basketball. Mm-hmm. Do you remember your first competitive game? But I remember the team that I played in, but I remember my first game. But I remember thinking, this is mad because it's really fast, wheelchair basketball. And it's even faster when you're new. So when you're a pro, it's always fast. But when you're kind of new to the sport, you're like, everyone's just flying past you and it's, the chair's really nimble. Because it must be quite a bit dangerous as well because it's not just people, it's like metal. It can be dangerous, yeah. yeah. I mean, people fall out of chairs. People just go, <gasps> like his chair is like, it's cool. Like when, um, you know, when Rashford or Sterling falls over on a football pitch, no one goes, <gasps> True. do they? You know what I mean? People fall over in sports. It happens. It's, it's not a big deal. Um, so yeah, it, is, it, is, it was, it was um, a good first season. I did that for a few years before I went to uh, Italy to play pro uh, many, many moons later, which, which was an interesting five years. I loved it. But no, wheelchair basketball was something that I, I made a lot of friends, traveled the world. I was, I was blessed. I was very fortunate. Yeah. How was that whole experience like becoming a competitive player? Like just in general? Because, I loved it. Yeah. I loved it. Uh, what you mean when I was pro in Italy? Both, or like before, as a semi-pro so as well as I went to pro. Italy, I mm-hmm. loved it. So we, uh, I played for yeah, a team called Bullets, um, in changed the Sparrows in Hackney here for like 15 years. Played for a team in Kent for a few years, but they folded. Loved it, loved it. I, I was really good at it, so I enjoyed it. Parallel to that, I was playing for, for, for yeah, for Great Britain as well. Um, you travel, you know, I, I love traveling. So I got to travel um, most of Europe, playing competitions um, in my late teens. I made some great friends. You're young, you're fit. Um, it, was, no, it, was, it was good times. I was also then getting into club promoting and, my dad's got a label which I was helping with the club club nights for as well. So I was DJing, playing wheelchair basketball, and a journalist at the same time. So it was an exciting period in, in, in my life that had lots of variety. That, yeah, at, that and then at that point, because you were you went from semi pro to professional, mm. right? <clears throat> what made you make that decision rather than like? So keep... I was broke. <laughs> I was broke. Just if I'm being honest, I was broke. <laughs> I needed some money. Had a bit of debt, and someone said to me about a year or two before I went. You know you can go and play in like the professional league in Germany or Turkey or get paid. I was like, really? So there's no professional league in the UK. Not in the UK, no. No, it's, it's it's mad. They spend a lot more money in investment in wheelchair basketball in teams on the continent. Why is that? Um, I don't know. I don't know. They just take it, I think, a bit more seriously than than they do here in the UK. So the top players, that not less so now, but up until about three or four years ago, the top players in this country, I think, at the last Paralympics. Every player in the squad, the men's team, bar two, played abroad. They all played in Spain, Italy, Germany, Turkey. Went right. abroad because um, the money's decent. Um, and someone said to me, "Yeah, you can play. You can get paid to to play abroad." And I was like, "Oh, sick! I can do this." So I applied for a couple of teams, and then I applied for a team. Uh, I put myself on this website where they kind of like look for look for players in the UK. A team from, I think Malaga, maybe it's Madrid, but Malaga got in touch with me and said, "Oh, we're looking for a forward. That's my role." We want to sign you up, blah, blah, blah. Got to the contract bit, all good. Signed it, sent it back. Never heard anything ever from them ever again. So I'm like, rah. So that, that, that just was a myth. It went missing. Cool. A year later, same thing. Team in Italy um, contacted me and said, yeah, we're looking for a 4.5. That's my position. Um, we'd love to bring you over. Flew me out to, to view the, the town, small town called Rieti in uh, just south, about 50 minutes south of Rome. Went out there, met the team, physio, met them all for like a weekend, showed me where I'd, where I'd be living. I was like, yeah, this is, this is cool. Signed the thing, came back, and then, yeah, a month later, went out for pre-season to, to, to start. That it was that quickly? It was that quick. And it was a risk, right? Because I didn't know anyone in Italy, could speak any Italian. It could have been some duppy thing. I could have been going out there like, and where's the ones gone missing? Like, I've never heard from her ever again. But I just thought, sure, try, try something. A, I needed the money. But B, I just thought this is a great life experience to kind of go to a new country, learn a new culture. Um, and I was there for, yeah, just under five years. And I, and I loved it. It was four of the best years of my life. Um, but it's great because I was like the Ronaldo like, of, of, the, of, of the town. I was, I, was, I, was, I was a big boy. I was a big deal. I was a big deal. You know what I mean? Um, and getting paid to play sport is the dream, right? I was, I was at you train at least once a day. So you do a gym session every day. We had team training sessions, like basketball sessions three times a week and a game on the weekend. So no, I was in good I was in good condition, earning decent money, but I was like, I was learning, I was growing as an individual because I was in another country, you know, speaking Italian, learning new food, the, the culture. Um, did you become fluent in Italian? I did, I, I'm not so much anymore, um, but I, I did, I, I was, um, 
yeah, yeah, I, 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 was, I, was, I, was, I was the guy. See, I, I'd always wonder this because when I look at um, English football, I feel, this is off tangent, by the way, but then I feel the reason why the English team doesn't perform as well as it could do is because not enough players play abroad. And um, more players need to have that experience of just like, taking a risk, assimilate yourself in a different culture, understand pressure. When people are shouting at you in a different language, how do you handle that? But what stops more players from taking that jump? I think the first thing is money. I think the, the, the money here in the Premier League is just on another level. I think the second reason is some people don't have that inquisitive nature about another culture. Some people just like, I'm English, I'm British, I'm happy here. It's all set up nice for me. Why would I move anywhere else? Whereas my question would be, well, why wouldn't you? <laughs> the UK is a very small country, bro. <laughs> it's a big world out there. Go and experience it and do it in another country. Where you haven't got to do it forever. Some of these guys could have a career abroad and be back by 25. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So it hasn't got to be forever, but just experience it. As you say, different kind of pressure, how they play football, their philosophy, their culture, their lifestyle. Um, I think most that do go abroad and do it, most of, I've, I've heard in interviews that they often say they come back not only better players, but better people. And I think I definitely came back a better person because I understood. I didn't like everything about Italian culture, but I got to understand it. Did you wish you'd done it a bit earlier as well? 100%. Yeah. 100%. But I'm a big believer in timing. So I believe that had I gone two, three, four years earlier, I might not have been in the, the mindset ready to, to have taken that challenge on. I might have gone and I might have hated it because I wasn't as a young man ready to have taken on being in another country. And I might have come back after a year and hated it. Um, I might not have been, in terms of my basketball progression, good enough to have been at that level at that time. So I think when I went was the right time for me personally to take on a new challenge. But also professionally, I felt I was good enough to hold my own at that level in that team, in that league. Whereas if I'd have gone yeah, two, three years earlier, I might have been, nah, this guy actually isn't that good. Let's send him back. So. Yeah, I'd have loved to have gone earlier on, but I, I believe that things happen when they're supposed to happen. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that. Timing is everything, right? Mm, it is. Yeah. It is. So then with the championships and your final and the finals mm. that you're in, like, what's, what's that experience like? I loved it. I loved it. Because here you don't get crowds. You don't, you don't really get crowds for wheelchair basketball in this country when you play games. So first of all, just seeing like, and it wasn't, it wasn't many, but when you've got three, four hundred people in a, in a, in a, in a stadium um, making noise, um, that, that, that's, 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 that's a big thing for me. We're used to having three or four people. You know, my man's girl and his brethren turn up to watch you and support you. That's cool, but like, there's an empty sports hall um, versus, you know, 300 people. And in the league above us, they would get maybe 2,000 people turning up to their games. They'd get people coming early for games. And that kind of was like, okay, this is a proper league. This is like, not something we all put together. This is like proper. Um, and just kind of being in that environment where you get to see a professional um, sports league in operation and being part of that, people chanting your name. People chanting my name. Now I'm like, this is this is sick. <laughs> what was your, what was your what? nickname? My, my name? Yeah, no, no. Did they call you like? Did they say JJB? Jordan, JJB. 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 Um, uh, Foster JJ. Um, <laughs> what else? They, they would just talk anything. They just put my name in it, and yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, 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 I do the whole play it cool. Like, I can't see you thing, but <laughs> I know you're there. I, I'm loving it. I'm gassed. I'm gassed. I'm gassed. I'm gassed. Yeah. Um, so just being in that environment where you get to see and be a part of, you know, there's money on the line here. There's, there's people getting paid to do a job here. You're not just here playing basketball on the weekend or Sunday league team. No, no, this is a business. And if you don't perform, there are consequences. And the, the limelight and the attention that you get on one side is great. But you start missing two or three layups in a row and your team loses, you're still going to find out about it. And you, you get the president calls you into the office on the Monday and says, what's going on? How can we help you? That happened to you? A couple of times, I had a couple of bad periods where my form dipped and the president and the coach would call you in for a meeting. Like, and it wasn't, like, it's funny because it wasn't like, it's very Italian in the way that it's not like a case of we're going to fire you or we're going we're gonna, we're gonna, to we're gonna end your contract now. But it'll be, that's what they were saying, but in a polite way. So they say stuff like, they say stuff like, you know, how can we help you? And what can we do to facilitate you being better? And what's wrong with your form? And but what they're really saying is, you better get better quick. Otherwise, you're on the playing bro. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I was like, okay, I get it. I, I need to put some more work in. And, and I did. And those, those dips in form, uh, there was one big dip that really got me down, actually. Really got me down. But, but you just work, work through it. And they, they, they support you. But it's, it's, it's a support that comes with a, we'll support you, but... You got a score, bro. You got a score those baskets. So um, yeah. At that point, though, so like, if you take us back to that time when you were suffering that low dip in form, how did you pick yourself up? 
You know what's mad? It was it was in my my third season. I was having a shocker. Most of that season, I was really bad, and I was one of the three imports. I think there was a, at that point a rule of three foreign imports allowed. It was me, an Australian, and a Swedish guy, and I, I was having a really really bad season. And my thing was, and I remember from my, my mum told me many, many, many things, but she said to me, when you're going through a difficult period, you gotta just get your head down and work through it. Just keep doing the right things that you believe are, are the right things and keep working. I'd actually heard um, a podcast that Eddie Hearn, the boxing promoter was on uh, about a year ago, where he said something similar. He said that any time he's down or he's having a really, really bad day, his dad told him, the key is get up an hour earlier and finish an hour later and just keep doing the right things. So basically just work hard. Now, some people would say now that's quite a toxic bit of advice to, 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 to have. Someone would say, actually, you need to pull away, get mind space and come again. I get that as well. But my way has always been, you're in a situation that isn't gonna change. So you haven't got time to step away and get that headspace. You just gotta go back to the core values. And it's just boring stuff like be on the, on the basketball court, under the basket, layups. Hitting, hitting that square, hitting that square, and just hitting 100 of those baskets, free throws. It's just the real boring, simple things that you go back to basics doing that you replicate, that you know once it clicks, come game time, it will click in the right time then as well. So there was no magic formula. But what I remember I did, when my form did turn, I was so proud of myself. I went out and bought, um, it's at home, I'm not wearing it now, but I went out and bought um, a watch. This was 15 years ago now. And I've changed the strap because the strap's gone bad like three or four times. But I've never ever thrown the watch away because the watch, it's a nice watch, but the watch, whenever I see it, reminds me of this was the rewards to yourself for getting through that. It was about six, seven months. I was really, I was having a really That's bad a long year. time. Yeah, man, I was having a shocker. I was having a shocker. Um, I was like Rashford. I keep mentioning it, but I was like Rashford at United for the last 18 months where he was poor and now he's the best player in the world. He's, not, he's on, on current form, you would say. But that was how, how I rewarded myself to say, look, you worked hard. You got your head down, you turned it around, and I bought this. It wasn't that expensive, but it was a watch that means more than just a watch. It was like a signifier of this is the, the object that shows or reminds you when you are having a tough period, just work hard. Just do the, keep doing, don't change. Keep doing the right things that got you here and just go back to basics. Yeah, I love that. It's like just going back into like a mental yeah, toolbox to remind yourself. Just yeah. what got you here. You're yeah. not a bad player. Yeah. You're a very good player, you're having a difficult time. Are you distracted? Is it a fitness thing? Is it a, uh, whatever it may be, just try and go through all the things that it could be. But at the end of the day, just go back to the court, put those hours in on your own, put the, score those free throws, those layups, push hard, work hard, do the right things, eat hard, and eventually it will come back, and it did. It also sounds to me a little bit of your competitiveness slash stubborn nature exactly. just coming through I, as I, well. I couldn't lose. Yeah. I couldn't lose. I had two or three years at that point where I was the main man, like walk through the town centre, that's JJ. J oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You're not know, autograph. Yeah, yeah, go, 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 go. Um, and then uh, the third year was like, I was having a shock and I was like, I can't, I can't go out like this. I can't, this, no, 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 we're not doing this. We're going to work hard. We're going to turn it around. I don't care how long it takes. And it was hard. I'd go home after training and I wouldn't cry, but I'd be, I'd be down. I'd be low. I'd be like, this is, because you know when you're playing a game and you miss that, that, that basket, that crucial basket. And no one says it, but you kind of sense everyone's thinking, oh, Jordan. You've got to score that. And especially over that period of time, you lose the trust of your teammates. Totally. They're they, not passing to you they, as much they, as they, they should be. They pass to you less. Yeah. Um, you know, they, 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 you're, you're playing less minutes. The coaches, I'm going from a guaranteed starter to now I'm coming on and off the bench and I'm now the impact, impact guy. Um, but that happens. You just got to, like I say, just get your head down and work hard. But it, it, it was tough, but I came through eventually. And, and as you say, part of my competitive nature wouldn't allow me to kind of go out like that. No, no way. It's so interesting because as a fan, we don't really think about what can be going through a player's heads, especially nowadays with the world of social media, the comments, the the like the, the views, everything. People can be just spewing so much hate on someone. And that kind of mental resilience, like with Rashford again as an example, 18 months of essentially hell where you're going through that, enduring it. People are saying you're spending too much time on politics rather than the game when in reality you're more than just a person. Um, yeah, just I just have to commend like sports players. I I, I do too. Like, I I had it at that level, but as you you rightly flag, 
there are athletes that are, you know, in, in bigger sports than wheelchair basketball that have a scrutiny and a profile that is just through the roof. And the minute they stop scoring goals or the minute they, you know, they can't serve properly or the minute they drop the ball, whatever it may be, especially in the 24-hour news cycle era that we're currently in, everyone is watching your every, your every move. And I turn the TV off when the game's done, I go out of business, but there's people that consume this stuff 24 seven and have an opinion to say. So when everyone, in, when everyone in the world has an opinion on you and your performance, that's gonna impact you. You walk into a restaurant, you know that everyone in the room's thinking. <laughs> oh, <it's> <laughs> in fact, if you go out to eat after losing a game, people are saying, why are you why going you out? out? <laughs> I can't eat. I can't, I can't eat now. Yeah. Like, I, well, lock me up to the next game. Is that, is that what we're doing here? Yeah. So it's like, nah. So I, I, I've been around people that are much more that, that are famous, and whether whether it's you know they're having a tough time as musicians and their last album kind of flopped, or they're athletes and they're having a bad, whatever it may be. I've been around people that, that, that and I, I see how it affects them. It affects. It, it's it's not just. It's every day. You turn your phone on. These people have got a million followers on on on, on Twitter. The phone's blowing up with people just blasting them. Like I said, you go into you get on into the restaurant. You go into a bar. You go. Phones out. Everything. Yeah. Everyone's just like, oh, that's 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 so and so. It's not a nice. You can feel the vibe. You can feel when people are looking at you. You know when people are looking at you like, oh, that's the heavyweight champion of the world, or that's the World Cup winner, that's the blah blah. And conversely, you can feel it the same way when it's negative. Oh, that's the guy that 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 got beat five 0 Do you know what I mean? So. It affects people and we're humans. So it's only right that I think we bear that in mind. I'm a, I'm a sports fan and if, if someone is not performing correctly, I will criticize them. I'm a journalist, so it's my job to kind of productively criticize that person. But at the same time, we're human beings and we have feelings and it's not nice. When you, that guy knows he's failing. He knows he's failing. Do you know what I mean? So how you critique that person, I think, is is is, is critical and crucial. No, I love that, and it's amazing just to how you got yourself out of that that space. And I guess so. This is year three, year four. So this is a third or fourth year. Yeah, yeah, I was there, um, and then I negotiated. <laughs> they wanted to re-sign me again for another season, and I said, okay, but I need to get more money next year. So this, so I, after my bad year, I turned it around. I had a, I had a good year. And then I was renegotiating my contract for the for the final year, and I was like, I want more money because I'm a, I'm a, gonna keep part of this team. I'm, I mean, I'm I'm out here. Like, come on, man, give me some love. And they were like, Oh, I'm not sure. Budget, budget, budget. I was like, Budget. Yeah. Listen, I want more money. Otherwise, I'm going. I'm going over there. There was no over there, by the way. But I just told them there was an over there. Um, okay, let's see what we can do. At the same time, that was the summer that Channel 4 knew, Channel 4, sorry, had won the broadcasting rights to the Paralympic Games. So up until, t up until that games, BBC had had the Paralympics and the Olympics, but the rights for the coverage, coverage were, were up for grabs and Channel 4 had won it. So I, w I came back every summer in the off season to, the, to London for like a month or two before I went back for preseason. I met up with a friend of mine, Sam Conniff, just for lunch, a catch up. And he's like, oh, forget all that, forget all that. I've had a meeting with someone at Channel 4 about something unrelated, but he's mentioned to me they've just finished their search for new presenting talent um, for the, the Paralympic Games in three years' time. So this is 09. I mentioned your name. He said, oh, the closing date is gone. But he said to me, if you can get a show reel in like yesterday, he'll, he'll consider it, he'll view it. So Sam's like, go and do a show reel, get it in now, and they'll check it out. So I called up a friend, um, Charlie, shout out Charlie, because he's an important part of where my story's gone on to. Did a show rule. Um, uh, when I watch it back now, I cringe. I cringe. I'm a lot slimmer and fitter, because I'm prime athlete now. I'm like, I'm but I'll cringe. It, was, it, was, it, it wasn't awful. I mean, the video was, he did a good job in it. I'm, I look awful, but whatever. Sent it in, and they were like, yeah, cool. Um, we're gonna put you as part of the cohort of presenters. We wanna train up to be presenter reporters for the games in three years time. So I had a budget to train up new disabled um, and vibrant talent to be the presenters for the games in three years time. So I'm like, ah, I've just negotiated. But at the same time, my, my president of my club had come back to me and said, okay, here's a new offer. So they'd give me what I wanted. So I was like, ah, I know I played hardball on that contracting, you know, but I'm not coming back, you know. So he was pissed, he was fuming, fuming. Imagine, yeah. Because was the training meant to be full time? So you couldn't so, do like- Yeah, it was a full time contract. So okay. I, could, I couldn't do both. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard Jamaicans cuss and swear, 
but it's is equally as 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 um, vitriolic or no as violent when you hear Italians cursing and swearing. I remember on the phone he's cussing and swearing. I'm like, Paolo, man, what do you want me to do? Like, allow me, man. I'm, come on, break, give me a break. Because they they're gonna source extra sponsorship just to facilitate my contract. So I was like, ah, oh, yeah, sorry, bro, I can't, I can't, I can't come back. Anyway, so, but it was a gamble, because although Channel 4 said to me, we'll put you on the program to be a presenter, there's no guarantee that you will be a presenter at the, at the games. So I was gambling, because I could have gone through all this and not gotten it. And, I, and even that, you could have played at the Olympics as well. Exactly, exactly. I could have, I could have continued to, I could have gone back to Italy and then trained to be part of the GB squad. Um, I wasn't in the squad at that point, but if I wanted to, I probably could have got myself into a position whereby I was at least in contention. So it was a massive gamble I was taking, but I thought, I've, I've, I'm a journalist. That's what I've, this is my chance to do what I want to do, be a sports broadcaster. So yeah, I, I, I took the gamble and, and, and then it paid off. So I did, they trained us up for two and a half years. We got paid to be trained up presenters. And the games came in 2012. Um, smashed it. We got every award that year going for, our, for our coverage. It was amazing. A, a game changer, I think, in British TV, but I'm biased. Um, and then, yeah, so it was funny because when, when, when the games finished, I was like, so that was a great three years. That was a great game. So you need a job. <laughs> what now? I've got no job. Um, but this is how, again, timing at the rap party, the rap Channel 4 Paralympic party or dinner, turned into a party. I was sat on the same table as the then new editor of Channel 4 News. He um, was saying to me how he saw my stuff during the games, my, my, my presenting, so he, I did a good job. I was saying how I, I enjoyed it, I loved it, I wanted to do more of it. He was quite drunk, <laughs> I got him more drunk, <laughs> I managed to get a meeting. And then I had a meeting with him, and he, he, won't, he won't know this, but I, we had a meeting, he called me for a meeting, and I thought I was only going in to have a chat about maybe doing some shadowing, some work experience. I, I was easy, I wasn't, I just wanted to come in and just meet them. By the end of the meeting, they were like, oh, why don't you come in and, and be, work with us for the next three months? I was like, oh, cool. Walked in just for, just for a vibe, walked out of a job, and you can do weekends with us and rare to Three months turned to another three months, another three months, let's do it again, three months, do it again, three months. 10 years, 10 and a half years later, now I'm, 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 I'm still, I'm still <laughs> there, hanging <laughs> on. Um, so, so yeah, that's kind of how I transitioned um, out of wheelchair basketball into sports broadcasting at that point then as well. Nice. So, so the, the, those first like um, three months, three months, six months and so on mm. and so forth, was that in front of TV or were you working yeah, yeah. on it? Yeah, yeah, so I was the sports reporter during the weekends and Kemi and Zerum, who still works with us, Channel 4 News, he was the sports correspondent. So he did a lot of the kind of more meatier, bigger, newsy sports stuff in the week. And I did the weekend, Man United versus Stoke, 12.30 on BT Sport, I'd wrap that. So I would edit that package, voice that package, um, and it got on the news. If there was a story that required me to be on screen, on, on my shifts, I'd be on screen as well. So I think it was funny because I think to this day, it, within the first two years, days could be a little bit off, but within the first two years of my job, I covered, I think, three of the biggest sporting stories there's ever been. Um, what was the third one? So the, I covered the Oscar Pistorius shooting, where he killed his wife, or he shot his wife. I covered that story. I covered the Lance Armstrong scandal um, as well. And what was the third one? I've forgotten the third one. There was a third one massive story anyway it was like three massive stories that if i'm not mistaken i think they were all within three years of each other maybe even two um and so yeah it was like i was thrown into the deep end but that's I, I prefer that i prefer that but that was another reason why i thought i've got to take this seriously as well because these are big sto big sports stories that go beyond sport that i need to be on point for did you always um want to be a journalist and then a sports journalist or more broad yeah, because I like talking. I like talking. Um, and it's, maybe it's an ego thing. I don't think it is, but it could be. But I like talking. I like delivering stories. I like telling news. I like delivering and telling people something. So that's kind of, that kind of happened. But sports wasn't actually the first thing I, was, I, I wanted to penetrate in terms of uh, genres. I started off mainly in music and youth culture writing. So I wrote for a magazine called Life Magazine in Brixton. It was mainly about music and, and youth culture. And then I decided once, I said to my mentor at the time, Callum McGeeock, big up Callum, 
I said to him, I want to move into sports journalism. And he said, cool, but just so you know, and I, I, this blew my mind, he said to me, just so you know, that's great, but sports journalism is the most competitive area of journalism out there. And I was a bit like, really? Like, yeah, more than music, more than politics, more than foreign stories. It's the most competitive area of journalism. But not to put me off, it was letting me know, like, if you want to go into that space, tool up, get ready, because everyone wants to go into sports journalism. So I was like, cool. He was kind of just letting me know it won't be easy because I think he knew that by telling me that it would it would make me want to do it even more. Do you know what I mean? If I knew that it was hard, I would up my game to ensure that I got in, whether it was in six months or six years, I'm getting in. Um, so yeah, the challenge was accepted that, you know, I like writing, I like sports. Come together. Where, where does that come from? Like when someone tells you, no, you want to keep going for it? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I don't think I'm inherently one of those people that you tell me, no, I want to do it more. But things that I care about and I want to achieve, if I'm told there's a barrier, there's something competitive nature in me just kind of says to me, okay, let's, let's go. And, 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 and I'm, not, I'm not in a rush. I'm not in a rush. So I'm happy to, it might take a day, it might take a year, it might take 10 years, but I'm going to get it eventually because it's what I want. There's not many things in life that I want, but the few things in life that I do want, I tend to get. Yeah. And do you think the editor saw that a bit in you when he wanted to give you that chance? I think he did. I think he did. I think he saw someone that was passionate about sports and news, first of all. But I think he saw someone that was young and hungry to try and find sports stories and really kind of take on and develop how Channel 4 News could de deliver their sports. Now, if I'm being honest, I don't think I've changed the face of how Channel 4 News delivers their sports coverage. There are reasons for that. But I, I think there was an energy that I think he saw in me that was like, OK, let this guy can present, this guy looks good on camera, he can, he can broadcast. Yeah, let's, 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 let's break you in. And you know, uh, three months by three months, you know, I think it's saw improvement in me. Mm. And I guess, cause you've not just worked for Channel 4, you worked for a few other publications. Yeah. Have you ever had to adjust or kind of change your editorial viewpoint based on the publication that you're working with? I used to, but I don't anymore. And let me tell you why, because I used to, because you have to be aware that when you are a writer or a broadcaster, each publication has a different audience. So I was very aware that who you're talking to is very important, but how you deliver what you're telling them is also very important. There's no point in delivering in a style. Give me an example, give me an example. I do stuff for AFTV, Arsenal Fan TV. Um, I also do stuff for Talk Sport. How I talk about Arsenal's win against Aston Villa to an Arsenal audience, and AFTV is a mainly Arsenal audience, will be different to how I talk about that game on Talk Sport to a football audience. Um, I, I, but even without tone, I'm, I'm, I'm much more. I was. I'm much more relaxed. Um, maybe I'm relaxed anyway. But on, on AFTV, it's a more informal platform. It's a more informal audience. So therefore, how I deliver, how I look. Is 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 a will reflect how I want to be. How I want to present myself to and, and what I'm presenting. Whereas with Talksport, I I I used to um, I used to be a lot more radio. It's radio. Um, but why I say I'm just, I'm changing that now is because I'm me, and I'm at a place in my career now whereby I'm a very very good broadcaster. Um, I think I'm reliable and trustworthy in what I'm delivering. My opinions can be wild. You might disagree with my opinions. That's fine, that's, that's totally fair game. But I'm trustworthy in what I'm delivering. And this is Jordan. And I'm not gonna give you a different Jordan um, on this platform to that platform. I may slightly tweak how I look and there may be small tweaks, but whereas before there'll be wholesale tweaks. It's a very different Jordan on Channel 4 News to I don't know, if I was doing something for Stan Sport, for example, it's a very, they were like night and day because I was catering to their audiences where now I'm like, no, 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 you're booking me for me. You're booking me for who the broadcaster I am and how I talk. And, if, and I'm, I'm at a place in my career where I'm that comfortable with who I am and how I work. If you don't like how I deliver, that's totally fine. That's your preference. Actually, you've got to look after your platform, your outlet. No problem, maybe I'm not for you. Cool, but we can't work together then. Let's, 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 let's leave it there. And the minute someone says to me, can you just, can you put that on? Or can you talk like this a bit? I'm like, no. Has that happened? Um, yes, it did. It did. It happened when I went for uh, an audition uh, for Sky Sports News many years ago. I was told um, in a very subtle way, but I saw it very overtly, 
um, of how they wanted me to deliver. And I'm like, mm, that's not how I talk. Or I'm very big on writing my own scripts because when you write your own scripts, it's your tongue and it sounds like you. When people write scripts for you, even if it's, even if it's accurate in, the, in what the content is, I don't, that's not a word I would use or that phrase isn't a phrase that I would use. It doesn't sound like me. And a lot of time when I was starting up a Channel 4 News, people would often say to me, you sound very different. I mean, even to this day, and I'm still, it's still, it's an, evolu it's an evolving process of me trying to be as authentically me as possible. But people more so back in the day said to me, when I watch on Channel 4 News, you sound very different to the Jordan that I know. Not worse, not better, just different. And I was like, okay, that's not, what I, that's not for me, that's not a good thing. I want you to hear me and be like, that's Jordan that I see the same idiot that I see in the club or in the where, what, do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? Sort of thing. So I'm always working on how can I just be me? Just just deliver how I deliver and talk how I talk. And I think there's now there's now a sway in mainstream broadcasting to identify to to um, to realize that people ain't gonna change for you. You've got to change for them, or you've got to be accommodated to the way that people talk. You look, you look at a lot of outlets now. They got influencers now presenting n national programs because they realise now that the audience are dictating how well a show does, and that's always been the case. But more so than ever, that's the case now. The audience are saying, "No, no, no, we want that guy or that girl to present that program. That's 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 old school." So the the, the broadcasters are now, okay. Well, if the audience are saying we want that, let's give them that. Yeah, it is quite interesting because like the face of a reporter or, or um, yeah or a journalist mm -hmm. before it was very neutral, yes. but I feel people follow the journalist, follow them. So whether you're for you, for example, on AFT, TalkSport, Channel 4, The Guardian, most likely someone who likes your views will listen to all of those four faces. Totally. And so it's in those publications. Totally. So it's interest to let you have your creative freedom. Exactly. And yeah. people are, as you say, people are buying into me. So I've, I think, again, broadcasters, are and I think industries and businesses, you'll know more than anybody, are realising now that people are coming with communities and the money and the popularity and the... The, the progress for companies now is to, I'm buying into this person because this person is a whole community that buys into him or her. So if I want to get to that community, I've got to, I've got to go with that person. Whereas before, I think it was a case of people would change f for the broadcaster. It's like, no, no, the broadcaster now is realizing that's where the community is, that's where the audience is. So let's go to the person that commands that audience and we know that they'll, they'll follow him or her, whether it's from that platform, that platform, that, wherever it may be, they're going with him because they trust him or her. Yeah, yeah. That reminds me of a story of, um, I think he's a Spanish well, um, Twitch streamer, actually. His name is called um, Ilbay Llanos. Il Il Ilbay Llanos. So he, um, he thinks he's got like millions of followers and he's one of the first people to have an interview with Messi, like straight when he moved to PSG. And it got a lot of Spanish reporters pissed off because it's someone who didn't go through the ranks, it's someone who's an influencer. He's got like close relationships with Gerard Piquet, um, Aguero, all the rest of it. And that kind of relationship has become de democratized, right? If you're just someone who's genuine and you're able to build relationship with players, then you're able to get communities, you're able to get broadcasters also interested in you. Um, how have you gone about like building relationships with players? Because we, as an ex-player as well, um, have you found it easy, quite difficult? Like, how does it happen? Um, so I think I think my relations with athletes or ex-athletes is born out of, I think first and foremost, the person that I am. I think that people gravitate to me and around me because I think and hope they just think I'm a decent person. So before my work comes into play, whether I'm a good writer or not, oh, he's cool. Yeah, yeah, he's, 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 he's polite, respectful, he's nice to be around, good vibes. Like, that's the first thing, because no matter how good a journalist you are, if, if I don't feel you, if I'm like, he's a bit of an idiot, he's a, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna be with you. But in journalism, trust is built up with relationships, and you build relationships by endearing that person to the person that you are, and they feel they can trust you as an individual. Second to that then is, okay, I trust his or her work. So again, that doesn't mean that I can't write something negative about you, because if you're, if you're mature enough, you will realize that if you're not performing properly, I'm gonna have to write or go and talk sport and say, oh, you, had a, you had a shocker today, you had, you had an awful one. I've got, that's just me being real. Um, it's not personal, I've just got to call it as it is. As long as I don't go too far with that, I should be allowed to do that. But that is trust, it's trust that 
when you are doing well, I'll be the first one championing you and praising you. When you're having a tough time, I've got to call you out as well. And I think as long as that authentic way of working is seen, people then will buy into you and they will give you quotes and they will give you interviews and they will give you time because they know not only are you a cool guy, but I trust you because your work stands up for itself. So I've always kind of garnered my, my relations through just treating people like human beings, first of all, just talk to people normal. And then secondly, there's a professional respect that I respect your time, um, I respect your craft and what you do, but do the same for me. So that kind of, that comes down to, again, punctuality. I find it really disrespectful when, when you're interviewing someone and that person rocks up an hour and a half late. And it's almost accepted in, it's not even just football, I think it's, it's amongst famous people, not all. Um, but I think that respect that goes back, that goes both ways needs to be acquired. This is idea that I need you more than you need me. Well, nah, not really, not really. Let's just be professional, do our job and go about our business. I think that's how I conduct myself. I think that is why people generally, when I call them, often will pick up the phone to me and, and talk to me. I might not get a quote from them, I might not get an interview with them, but they'll at least engage. I think that is something when you've got footballers and musicians and famous people who've got a million people calling their phone, I take pride they they answer my call. Not all the time, but some of the time. You answered that very comprehensively. <laughs> it, it reminds me of a story um, that Stephen A. Smith was saying like on another podcast. Like um, He might be able to explain why a player didn't play well because of personal reasons, such as they were partying out. They were partying too late. They were taking drugs, this and the other. But he holds back. And then that's how he, that's one of the ways in which he earns trust with his players. Um, English media is not like that at all. Do you, I don't say you want to get tempted, but do you see other, say, journalists who go into that little kind of grey area zone where rather than focusing on, say, the talent or the game that people are, that these players are doing, they start going into a bit more of the personal, bit dirty kind of ways to mar them up, as it were? Yes, but I don't think that's, that, that, that's not unique, I don't think, to British journalists. Stephen A. Smith is an example of someone that doesn't do that, but there'll be plenty of, of broadcasters and journalists in America that do do that. So I don't wanna, I don't wanna pit this as American journalists don't do that, but British guys do. I think they all do it. Um, I think journalists are looking for a story. I think most journalists that I know and work with have integrity and understand the mechanics of writing a story of what needs to be included and what doesn't and what should be included and what shouldn't be included. And I think, I think generally most of the time journalists get that right um, they get a bad press, I think, in this country of as people that just want to write whatever to get clicks and to get to get attention. I think that's unfair, um, but there are examples of stuff that I've read where I'm like, mm, did you need to include that, or was that really relevant, or have you thrown them under the bus there because you know that's going to get you? So I think it's about is what you know relevant to the story you're trying to tell. I know all kinds of things about, about individuals and athletes and players that are interesting, but is it relevant to what I'm talking about here and now? If somebody didn't perform well, let's just take football again. If someone didn't perform well in a, in a big game, for example, because they were out the night before till five in the morning and they had a midday game um, the following day, and it was quite clear that person's performance was significantly below standard, and I knew that person was out doing all kinds of stuff the night before. I think it's relevant to include that in my, in my column or in my match report. It's relevant. You are a professional athlete paid to do a job to the best of your ability. You've been unprofessional. There are people that are paying a lot of money to watch you play football and you're out the night before partying. Now, if you're going to party and, and do that, then cool. But you, you better perform. You better perform. So people may still reveal that you were out the night before, but as we all know, people care less then. You just got a hat trick. No one cares if you were out till six in the morning doing whatever. Do you know what I mean? So it's still unprofessional, but the way that the, the human brain works is, well, yeah, but we won four three and he scored the win in the, in the 91st minute, so mm, gets a pass. The minute you don't perform is when that gets scrutinized even more. So for me, it's about what you know and is it relevant to the story you're trying to tell? And if it's not, it might be interesting, but is it relevant? And if it's not relevant, then I wouldn't throw anyone under the bus just because I know that if I include that, yeah, you know, he was out till six in the morning doing coke and doing God knows what, 
that's going to get me a front page. I'm, I'm, I'm sorted. I'm good. But A, that athlete won't trust me ever again. B, no one will ever trust me again. Um, and C, the pay pop or where I, where I work may fire me because they may feel, well, that club has now banned our writers from being in that press conference. So yeah, you've got a great story that's got us lots of, lots of clicks, but the long-term relationship that we have as a paper or as a news program with that club or that individual is now done. It's now done. So and as an example, I won't name the player, but as an example of someone I knew that did that, of an interview with somebody, and um, they just trashed the person when that wasn't really what the agreement was supposed to be on, what the interview was meant to be about. They printed the story and it was like, it was, it was the opposite of what they agreed. So now that journal may think, oh, I, got, I did a great thing with so-and-so. But if I'm the editor of that paper, I'm thinking, yeah, but you now know that that player and that club, they're never going to work with us ever again. So I think it's about what you, what you know and uh, is it relevant to the story you're trying to tell? There's all, we can all have after-party chat and, yeah, you know what, my man, da, da, da. We, can all, we can all, I don't, but some do. But when it comes to your actual work, if you put that in your work, you better be very confident that it's relevant and it was... It was it was a, a bit of information that was needed to tell the story you were trying to tell. Yeah. And then over the last 10 years, if you look at the players across different sports, the ones that make it and the ones that don't make it, mm -hmm. what's been the biggest insight that you've seen? I think luck plays a massive role um, in anything. If you're going to get to the top, if you're going to be like a champion stage, you're going to be like one of the best in the world. I think the athletes that tend to be there have a, have a lot of luck. But I'm a big believer in the hardest workers in life are the luckiest people, and the luckiest people in life are the people that work the hardest. So I'm a big believer in you, you earn your own luck, that phrase. People think, ah, I, I think it's true. I think the harder you work, and you don't see it at the time, you don't see it at the time, but you'll get the breaks. Those that cut quarters, those that, those that don't put in, they go 70% and want the top rewards, they don't get no breaks. But the ones that work hard end up getting the breaks. So I think luck plays a role. I think the ones that are Selfish, and I think selfish is, is often the, the connotation around the word selfish is always negative. I don't think it should always be should always be negative. I think selfish can be a positive thing. The ones that are driven, focused, self-minded, that I want to achieve X goal, and I'm going to achieve it. Now, whether you're with me or not, I don't care. I am achieving. I want to win a Ballon d'Or, or I want to win a Grand Slam, or I want to get a number one album at the Grammys, whatever it may be, and I'm gonna work every day and every night to ensure that I'm in a position to deliver what I need to deliver, whether it's a service or a product that ensures that I get that outcome. And again, it might take a year, it might take 10 years, but I'm going to be driven. And you often hear about athletes talking about how the toll it takes on their families when they're, when they're, when they're competing, because you have to be selfish. You have to miss, miss out on functions and dinners and time with your wife or your partner. You have to miss out on maybe seeing your son or daughter born. And, and I, the, way, the way champions are wired, I, f I find very interesting because they have a different mindset. There was a great conversation between Gary Neville, the, the Sky Sports uh, uh, pundit, and um, I think it was Jamie Carragher, also a pundit. No, it was Roy Keane. And they were saying, Gary Neville was saying how they were talking about Ronaldo and why he was acting the way he was acting. And Gary Neville was saying, whilst I don't condone his antics, I understand it because the way that he's wired, he's wired that I've been the greatest for so long, I can't let that go. And the way that my brain works is, everything that I do is geared towards being the greatest. So I've got to play every game. I've got to play, I've got to start every game. I've got to have the best conditions around me. I've got to have the best of everything. Not realizing that, Bro, you're 37, 38, like you're getting older. So, but, but the brain doesn't tell him that. The brain tells him, no, I'm still 24. I can still play 90 minutes, four days a week. I can, no, bro, you can't. And I think the champion mindset is that. It's, I'm, I'm, I want to be the best and there's nothing, nothing, age, fitness, family, nothing else comes, is, is going to stop me from getting that thing. So I think the ones that get to the top are the ones that are just very, very ruthless, very selfish and very driven in what they want to achieve. You need, obviously, need talent as well. You need a bit of element of talent and the right people around you. But I think those are the two things, being driven and, and, a, and a bit of luck. But I think the luck comes from being driven.
I think the two are kind of intertwined. The most driven people get the breaks. It's interesting because um, I'm a Tottenham fan, bro. I'm a Tottenham oh, fan. That, <laughs> I'm really sorry, man. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Even the microphone went to the punch me in my face. <laughs> but like, um, I look at Harry Kane, yeah. Mm -hmm. Honestly, arguably one of the best strikers. Like, the, oh, come on now, come on. All right, the hater. But like, if I compare him to yes. say like Olivier Giroud. Yes, great comparison. Harry Kane is like 10 times the player Giroud is. But Giroud... Not about 10, maybe 9, maybe 8. 9.5, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but Giroud has been so lucky in his career, being in the right place, right time. And his accolades, his, his championships, his trophies, everything like that is there to show up for him. And if you look at it from a like for like, you can say that Giroud is a, is a winner. Like he knows how to do it. And so I look at Harry and I'm thinking he needs to be more selfish you know like I think he's done what he can do at Tottenham I feel like the club has let him down and I wonder if he himself will just be selfish and take the leap and go at United so somewhere. So two things with that I find the mm. whole Carrie Kane discussion very interesting and I'm a little bit now past the whole you know is he world class not he's not won any things has he got has he got a leaf spurs because so, whatever the two things with that is one no one has asked Harry Kane what he wants but will he ever say it though he might not, but we're all talking on his behalf that, well, he must want to win Premier Leagues. He must want to achieve the greatest trophies. It might be, for, for Harry Kane, it might be important for him to have peace of mind in an environment that he's comfortable in, that he's settled in, with a fan base that adore him. And maybe, I, I, don't, I can't understand this personally because I'm not wired that way, but for him, happiness for him might be, you know, I'm going to get an average Tottenham team top four. I'm going to get... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to score X amount of goals for this team that I love. Now, you guys out there can't see it because you guys want you think I should be winning trophies. Yeah, I would love to win trophies. But what's more important than me, for me than trophies is being happy. And for him, being happy might be scoring 200, 300, 400 goals for Tottenham Hotspur. Now, I don't, I don't, I don't, wanna, don't know why you want to be the Spurs, <laughs> in it? Like, that's that, I can't get into that mindset. But I think the discussion around... Should Harry Kane leave to be to, 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 to be fulfilled needs to be looked at a bit more differently. It should be, what does Harry Kane want? What, what makes him happy? Why is no one asking the question? Though? Well, I, I've not seen many interviews with Harry Kane, to be fair. So maybe the access to him is, is, is harder. He's England captain. He's, you, know, he, you can't just kind of call him up and get him on the phone sort of thing. But I find that's the first thing that's interesting. What does he want? And the second thing is, is it incumbent on Spurs to make Harry Kane happy? I also kind of hear the argument that Spurs haven't done their bit for Kane. It's not Spurs don't wait for Harry Kane. Spurs have to, have to do what's best for them. And they've done an amazing job in terms of making money. They have. And it's for Harry Kane to decide, okay, I want more. If you can't give me more, that's fine. I have to go over there. Do you know what I mean? So it's not, on, it's not Spurs' job to make Harry Kane a winner and make him happy. Do you know what I mean? It's Spurs' job to do what they feel is best for them as a club and a business. Mm. I, mean, I mean, I still think it goes both ways because... What, like what we said about Pep, right? You find one good player and you build around them. And I think with Kane, with Modric, with some, we've had so many players where you could build around them and build a team that can actually go forward and win championships. It just feels that at the last mile, Lever just comes up short with his bargain with his bargain buyers, and that's why I just feel it's quite disappointing because there've been so many times where we've just fallen short, just that little bit short, and we could have done it. What's been your north star? Like, what's been just keeping you ground, grounded because I'm pretty sure like it hasn't been easy you know especially like trying to fall for such a long time as well like you've probably seen other opportunities you wanted to stay there like what's been keeping you going good question um what keeps me going is the want and the need to help other people my industry media and specifically sports media is a fantastic industry to work in. It's very lucrative, but it's a lot of fun. You meet some great people. If you're passionate about sport, it's the place to be. You get to travel the world and meet some, and just be part of amazing moments. And I think for too long, people that have come from where I come from, I'm from Brixton, I'm black, I'm dark-skinned black, and I think that's relevant as well, um, have been unofficially or subtly told, nah, this place ain't for you. Leave this to the guys that come from those universities over there that have a certain dress code or have a certain dad or mom or come from certain, certain parts of society. So my work now is all about how can I make sure that my legacy is in 10, 20 years time, I will turn on Channel 4 News or ITV News or Sky Sports News, whatever pr publication it may be, and it's just normal to see people that look like me 
presenting and broadcasting. And more so, the work that's been done now, because I think we're doing a great job there, more so what's, what needs to be done is behind the scenes. The editors, the directors, the exec producers, the producers, are they women? Are they black? Are they disabled? That's what, that's what drives me on. So my job now is, what keeps me grounded is, I've got work to do. I've got work to do, and I've got a big mouth, and I will use my big mouth to try and call out people that aren't doing their jobs in ensuring that this is an industry that is democratized, that is equal for all. We should all have a chance of coming through. I've got a gift, my gift is my confidence. I don't have many gifts, but I have a few. One of them is my confidence. How can I use my confidence to amplify their voices? How can I use my confidence to call out those people? So I don't have no shame. I don't have any shame. I'll call you out. I will call out anybody, whilst at the same time, okay, let's bring these guys through. And that's what, with my Black Academic Company, we're trying to do two fronts. Jordan, trying to diversify the mainstream, but Black Academic is saying, but we can also have our own space over here as well. Jordan, thank you so much. This has been a, an amazing experience and an thank amazing conversation. Me, um, last question to end it. Go. What was the worst piece of advice you've ever received and why? Oh, great question. Um, <laughs> you know what it was? I, I could, if I thought about it some more, I could think of some better ones or, or some other ones. But one that comes to mind, the, the worst piece of advice I ever received was from me. Okay. It was from me to me. I had a job interview at Harrods years ago and I had cane row and I cut my hair off, I cut my locks off, short like you, um, because I told myself, you, if you have cane row, you ain't getting this job, bro. You ain't getting this job. Cut your hair off, you'll get the job, you'll get it. You'll get it. I'm quite charming, I'm quite amenable, I'm quite friendly, I'm hard working, CV was decent, you know, worked at two gaps, worked at two nexts, Tesco's, Come on, man, this is light work. I didn't get the job. Didn't get the job. And when I, when I got the rejection, rejection letter, I said to myself, I'm never, ever, ever going to conform for another job ever in my life. I was so disappointed. I grew my hair back and it was fine in the long run. But the mere fact that I told myself that I needed to change myself to get a particular job um, really angered me. And look, I was young and you grow and you learn. And the irony is, you go to Harrods now, all the black boys there now got camera and, 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 and locked, you know what I mean? Um, but I told myself, maybe wrongly or right, I don't know, but I told myself that, nah, if you look that way, you ain't gonna get, and now I'm just like, you know what, I've got locks. It's a big part of what I do now in my, in my, in my work. When, I, when I, I do the noon sometimes, Channel 4 News, present the noon. And when I do the noon, I take my, take my locks out, take out my band, take my, take my locks out, it's on purpose. The reason I do it on purpose is I want people to see me and realize, oh, I can have Camro and present the national news. Or I can have a weave and present, I, oh, I can have a, I can, I can look however I want to look and present the national news. And I, I want that to be a message to young black boys and girls in particular. Just be good, be good and work hard. If you work hard and you're good at what you do, you will cut through. You haven't got to change your voice or your accent or your hairstyle, or how you dress. Just be good and work hard. That is what I would advise people to do, um, because that wasn't the advice I gave myself. I changed because I had an idea of what Harris wanted. Um, and, and I didn't get the job anyway. So even if I'd have got the job, having changed my, cut my hair, I'd have still been angry, because I'd, I'd have still changed to have got the job. The fact I didn't get the job made it 10 times worse. Do you know what I mean? It was like, you didn't, you didn't get the job. Um, so that, that was probably the worst advice I, was, I ever received, and it came from, came from Jordan. Love that. And then best advice, I'm going to throw that in there. Always be kind and nice to the people on the way up, because they'll be the same people you'll meet on the way down. I've got so many jobs, so many opportunities for jobs from people that I'd forgotten about, but because I was respectful, I was kind, I was nice to them, people remember that. And they remember when you're horrible as well, they remember that. And because I, was, I treated them in the right way, when the job thing came up, when someone was thinking, oh, it's called Jordan, they, they, they referenced my name. You never know who you may meet. The person that was a runner for you on that small production today, four years time, that person that head of Netflix Europe. And I've, I've, I know of people that have missed out on jobs because people who they were rude to when they were coming through are now senior at BBC or senior at Amazon or senior at whatever company 
they've applied for the job. Oh, you, you remember me? No, oh, but I remember you. <laughs> I remember you. Yeah, you can go. <laughs> you can, it seems to be done. You can go. So I've, I've heard that happen. So my, my, one of my advice would be, yeah, just be kind. and Even the runners in particular, because the runners are the ones that eventually end up becoming, the chief, 10 years later, it might be 10 years later, CEOs. They're the ones that are going to run. Remember me? Ah, oh, you were getting my drink. And you were nice to me, and you were kind to me, and you spoke to me, and you, you weren't an idiot to me. And yeah, I remembered that, and you're also good. I've got a project for you. So always be nice to people on the way up, because they'll be the same people you'll meet on the way down. JJB, it's a pleasure. Pleasure's all Thank mine. you so much. Thank you.